The Joe Robbins series features an Austin-based amateur detective with a head for numbers and a knack for finding trouble. You can buy the full set of four novels on Amazon for $10 plus tax. To find the novels, type the Joe Robbins series into the Amazon search bar. Welcome to the Sheila Stories, which relate an Australian woman's life of adventure and romance. I'm Pat Kelly, your host and storyteller. To get us all back up to speed, in the last episode we heard the story The Whole World, which occurred in 1992. At the end of the story, the narrator Thomas revealed to his daughters Natalie and April that Sheila was in fact a real person their deceased mother had known when she was young. Although April had suspected as much during the telling of the story, this revelation came as a complete surprise to Natalie. After the story, the two girls stayed up late to compare notes on old stories, going back in time to put together all the pieces of the puzzle. In today's episode, we will return to Cape Bay, New Jersey, and hear the story Last Beach Day. This is the final episode of the Sheila stories, and because we have some loose ends to tie up, it will run longer than most of the stories. After the story, I will rejoin you as usual for some light commentary. And now, here is the final Sheila story. Last Beach Day Colin rode a tall black mare 30 feet in front of Sheila. Her torso rocked in unison with Kira's motion. The saddle leather creaked. Heat shimmers rose from the dry land, not a cloud in the sky. He pointed to the right. You see it? That cluster of trees? There must be a spring. We could put a well there. He turned to scan the horizon on the left. It's not the best land for sure, but we can make it work, and the price is good. She kept running the numbers in her head, but they didn't add up. She had a pile of debt from the last land purchase. She needed money from the next shearing to keep the bank happy. Colin knew the land and the sheep and the cattle, but he wasn't great with the business side. He was like David or maybe vice versa. She would ask John for his thoughts. She blinked and the heat dissipated. Wearing a powder blue dress, she walked around the edge of the dance floor to where Colin chatted with the rancher. What was his name? Stuart Cunningham? Yes. Couples waltzed, the men twirling the women in perfect steps. The music approached the end of the number. She tapped Colin on the shoulder. Are you going to talk cattle all night or ask me to dance? Stuart Cunningham raised his eyebrows. He scanned her from toes to face and then said, I don't think that was a question. He shook Colin's hand and left. They danced for a long time, and all the while Colin whispered in her ear. He told her she was beautiful and he loved her very much. They grew thirsty and went to the punch bowl. Colin handed her a glass, but it was lemonade. They sat at the white wicker table at the edge of the valley. A hawk glided high above them, searching for a meal. She set her cup down. That's the best lemonade I've ever tasted, he said. A breeze blew against her face, but not that of the valley. The air smelled of the ocean, but not like Manly Beach. It was freshened by thick green leaves. Cape May. She woke up, blinked, and turned to see the maple tree through the open window. The dream had come to her many times with slight variations. She and Colin first rode horses on one of the properties. Then they danced, and they finished by sitting at the white wicker table next to the dream house she never built. What did the dream mean? Did another world wait for her? 
A better world? It made little sense to ponder the questions. She'd asked them many times, but never received an answer. The covers were pulled to her chest. She reached to the other side of the bed, but it was empty, and she sighed. Oh, what she would give to feel Neil beside her one more time. He had passed away three years earlier, but she still longed for his touch. In the night, she dreamed of Colin, but in the day, she thought of Neil. They had been together for such a long time, a wonderful marriage, filled with kids and grandkids and accomplishments. He never complained, not even at the end, after the illness had worn him down to nothing. On his deathbed, he had whispered, Forty-six years with the woman of my dreams. What man could ask for more? She leaned up, and a sharp pain shot from the back of her shoulder clear to the base of her spine. Ouch! She lay down again. The physical therapist had told her to roll from the bed to keep the pain at bay. Damn, therapist! she said to no one. They can't cure the problem, so they give you exercises that cause more pain. But she rolled to the right, swung her legs off the bed, and used their weight to lever herself into a sitting position. Her ankles hurt, and her wrists hurt, and her left knee hurt. And the wrinkles were everywhere. Life seemed hardly worth living anymore. No, what a stupid notion. There was always something else to do, something to look forward to. And then she remembered. Julie and her husband were coming for the weekend. Julie wanted to teach him to surf. They had taken to going to the shore in Brigantine, where his parents had a place. But Julie didn't like the waves there. She didn't know the beaches like those of Cape May. Even Linda's hovering couldn't spoil Sheila's day. Linda fretted about her like a bird at a feeder, making sure the chair sat well under the umbrella to prevent the sun from touching an inch of her skin. Sheila stretched her leg until her bare foot crossed the shadow. Oh, what delicious warmth. Mom, quit being a pain in the ass, said Linda. Dr. Gladstone would have a fit. Doctors, doctors, said Sheila. A bunch of killjoys. Stay out of the sun, they say, but don't forget your vitamin D. They make no sense. Out on the waves, Julie tried to teach Thomas how to surf. She had given him a crash course on the sand, where he was a quick study, and then they had gone into the water. He tried hard, but lacked coordination. He could stand on the board, but whenever a ripple bobbled it, Thomas took a tumble. He reminded Sheila of Freddie Parker. Linda continued to fret, but she would leave soon. She had real work to do. The surf shop was short-staffed, and there were painters at the B&B. Where's your cane? asked Linda. Sheila hesitated, but then said, I've hidden it under this towel. Linda shook her head and smiled. I've got to go, she said. Call my cell if you need anything. Why don't you take tomorrow off? said Sheila. Go surfing. Look at those waves. Linda turned toward Julie and Thomas. A perfect wave approached. Julie pushed the board at the right moment. Thomas got on his knees, stood, rode for a few seconds, and then fell. That would be fun, said Linda. Do it. Ask Jennifer to run the shop. She could use the extra money. I'll think about it, said Linda. She bent to kiss Sheila on the cheek. Love you. Love you. Linda trotted from the beach, and Sheila shifted her chair closer to the edge of the shadow. She lifted the cover up and pushed her legs into the sun. Not bad-looking legs for 88. Her skin was still smooth there, and her feet long and narrow. Not bloated like some women her age. But underneath the rest of the robe, she was a wrinkled mess. She recalled the stares young men gave her on the beaches of Sydney, and the longing in the soldiers' eyes in the dance halls during World War II. Later, in her thirties and one of the only surfers on the Jersey shore, 
The men had studied her every move. These thoughts warmed her heart like the sun warmed her feet. Julie jogged toward her, leaving Thomas behind to practice. She was as pretty as ever, with toned muscles and shiny hair. Sheila envied her tanned skin. Julie walked the last few paces with drops of water clinging to her face and shoulders and arms. She reached for a towel and pulled up a chair. Thomas is doing fine, said Sheila. Julie laughed. He's trying. It was my idea. He'd just as soon sit on the beach and read. She watched her husband with sparkling eyes, her face beaming, then turned to Sheila. Do you remember how I said I would surf the world? Yes. I wanted to surf in California and Hawaii and South America. Sheila nodded. As a girl, Julie always had big dreams. Dreams would take a person a long way. It doesn't look like I'll make it, said Julie, at least not in the short term. Why ever not? I'm pregnant. Oh. Her pregnancy didn't show yet. To be married and expecting at the age of 25 seemed like rushing. But then Julie had always hurried life, eager to try the next thing, to take on the next challenge. Raising a child certainly qualified as a challenge. Congratulations. I'm happy for you. Julie glowed. She talked fast, her words running over each other. We hadn't planned to start the family right away, but we got a little careless, and you know... But I'm thrilled. I never expected to get so excited about becoming a mother. Her joy was infectious, and Sheila's face pulled into a smile. She took a deep breath and grasped Julie's arm. I can't wait to see your baby. You must bring her here to Cape May so I can play with her on the beach. How do you know I'll have a girl? Sheila chuckled. I don't know, but I can feel it. I'm positive. Julie did have a girl, and two years later she had a second girl, but she didn't bring the girls to visit Sheila. Julie's mother, Maggie, had moved to Virginia years ago, and Thomas's parents had their own place in Brigantine. And like most young working couples, Julie and Thomas grew busy with work. Diapers, a fixer-upper house, a crawling infant to chase, and a stroller to be strolled. Sheila was busy, too, with grandchildren and great-grandchildren, all of them with birthdays requiring gifts and cards. Four years passed before Julie and Thomas returned to Cape May, and when they did come, they left the children in Brigantine. When Julie called about the trip beforehand, she said she and Thomas craved a day and a night away from the children. Is that okay? Julie had said on the phone. Of course, said Sheila. Every couple needs time for themselves. But Sheila was disappointed. She wanted to hold the little girls, to see them smile and hear them laugh with delight when Julie dipped their feet in the ocean. Nevertheless, on the appointed day, she waited on the porch for Julie to arrive, her heart beating irregularly, as it did nowadays whenever she became excited. They drove up in a dark blue Honda. Sheila rocked forward, took a moment to steady her legs, and then pushed up with both hands. At the age of 92, standing was no small feat. She swayed and touched the walker for support, but then she stood tall. Julie bounded up the steps to give her a hug. Her smile so big her face could hardly hold it. She felt young and energetic, but her eyes welled with tears. With a wipe of her hand, she turned to look for Thomas. He wheeled an overnight bag toward the porch. What room are we in? said Julie. Linda has you in number four, second floor on the right. You're a long way from me, so make as much noise as you like. Julie laughed at that comment. Thomas struggled up the stairs with the roller bag in hand. He stumbled on the last step and nearly fell. He gave Sheila a soft hug. His hands shook as if from tension, and his eyes lacked any sign of joy. Dark circles spoke of a recent lack of sleep. Were they having problems with their marriage? 
They didn't act like a young couple in love. A hollow feeling entered her chest, and her legs grew weak. She settled slowly into the rocker. Can you take the bag upstairs? Julie asked Thomas. I want to chat with Sheila for a minute. Sure. Julie pulled a chair up close and held Sheila's hand. Her smile spoke of sadness, of pending loss. I... I have some bad news. I wanted to tell you in person. What is it, dear? said Sheila. It must be bad. Divorce. Or perhaps a problem with one of the kids. I have cancer. Oh, Jesus! Poor thing! What is it? Breast cancer? No. Worse. Pancreatic. Oh, my God! A cold sensation flooded Sheila. Her hands grew numb. Her mind swirled. This is not right. This is unfair. But she didn't cry. Not then, because Julie's face was falling apart. The tears sprung faster than she could wipe them away. She came closer, and Sheila hugged her as hard as she could. When Julie could speak again, she provided more details. It was quite rare for a young woman to have pancreatic cancer, the worst kind of luck. The doctors were not optimistic. The experimental drugs had shown limited ability to prolong life. Some patients lasted a year, but most died sooner. After they'd finished the medical discussion, Julie said, I'm going surfing. She managed a genuine smile. I told Thomas he must stay here. I'm having a good day, between treatments, and I never know when. Her eyes drifted off the porch to the flowers beyond the railing. Two girls rode past on bicycles. They sang a pop song at the top of their lungs. Julie's eyes twinkled. This could be my last beach day, but I might also surf the best waves of my life. She squeezed Sheila's hand. Thank you, Sheila, for all the lessons, for showing me the beauty of life. Thank you for the stories. She ran upstairs to change and came down in a bikini. After grabbing one of the guest bikes, she blew a kiss and rode down Franklin toward the beach. A while later, footsteps descended the stairs. Sheila wiped the tears from her cheeks, swallowed, and sat straight in the rocker. When Thomas came out, she tried to smile. He approached the chair as if he didn't want to be there, but had nowhere else to go. Dull eyes peered out from a hopeless face. What could she say? She lifted her hand from the armrest, but then put it back again. I've cried and cried and cried, he said, but it doesn't help. He opened his mouth several times, but closed it again without saying anything. He leaned forward and rubbed his hands together, perhaps to keep them from shaking. I'll be lost without her. She's everything. He coughed. The words stuck in his mouth. He breathed fast and shook his head back and forth with machine-like precision, over and over, as if stuck in a loop. Thomas! She reached for his arm. His head stopped the crazy movement, and he said in a straightforward tone, I don't know what to do. His brow furrowed and his eyes turned angry, as if someone had asked him to accomplish the impossible. He smacked a fist into his palm and said, I can't do it. Yes, you can, she said. The girls are so young. April is only fifteen months. I just, I just, I don't know what to do. You have to be strong, she implored him. Look at me. His eyes were filled with doubt. His lips trembled. Now is your time, she said. Life is challenging you. He swallowed hard. He knew the truth. She could see it on his face, but he needed someone to say it out loud. There is no one else, she said. It has to be you. She will need you now more than ever. And when she is gone, the girls will need you to always be there for them, for years and years to come. He bit his lip as if he wished to draw blood. It's going to be hard, she said. You'll grow so tired you want to lay the burden down. But you must never give up. You must never, 
never give up. He took a deep breath and looked away from her, over the porch railing, staring now, not at anything physical. He stared at a concept, a challenge, a vow he must take. Determination crept into his jawline. I can do it, he said. I'll never, never give up. I blow my nose in a handkerchief. I never carried one until Julie got sick, but for the last seven years, I've always kept one in easy reach. The girls appear stunned. Natalie blinks every few seconds. April holds Spot tightly. And then they lunge for me at the same time. You did it, Daddy, says Natalie. You're the best daddy in the world, says April. We're in a group hug, swaying on top of April's bed. Chris comforts me with tender eyes. I reach to pull her into the cluster. This is the happiest moment of my life. A few minutes later, the girls begin to ask questions. Did Julie's dreams come true? Did she surf in Hawaii and South America? Yes. Did she go on a photo safari in Africa? No. At some point, they switch gears and ask about Sheila. They're curious. What happened to the anti-war protest? I don't know. How many grandchildren did she have? I don't know. Who runs the B&B now? Did she ever see Tom and Hazel again? I don't know. I don't know any more stories. That's the last one. They grow quiet as the realization slowly settles. The stories are over. We can revisit them as much as we please, but there is no new material, no more adventures, no more romance. Natalie shakes her head in frustration. But it's a story without an ending. How does Sheila die? Surely you can tell us that story. She's right. I have the answer, but it's not a story. I never said she died, I say. Wonder slips onto their faces. Dare they dream it? Sheila was born in October of 1916, a century ago. No one lives for that long. Yes, I say, Sheila is alive. She still lives in the B&B &B on Cape May. I saw her four weeks ago. Their eyes go buggy. April swallows and lifts her chin in hope. We'll visit her next Saturday, I say. If you want to hear more stories, you'll have to ask her yourself. When I first met Sheila in 2005, she was 88 and her body had begun to shrink, but she's even smaller now. She sits in a rocker on the porch with an attendant nearby. I give her a hug and make introductions. The girls stand six feet away, shy. The woman before them is older than anyone they've ever seen. How different she must look from the young woman in the stories. So wrinkled, her hair gray, her hands shaky. She leans forward and lifts her arms. Don't stand petrified, girls. Give me a hug. They run to her, and after the hug, they stand on either side of her, as close as they can get. She has an arm around each girl. Natalie? She says, you have your mother's complexion. In April, you have her hair. But you both have her face. Just beautiful. Both of you. Sheila wants to know everything. How was the drive? Do they like the beach? Oh, yes. Brigantine's nice. You're right. We do have taller trees here. Did you bring your bathing suits? Oh, good. We've got boogie boards, umbrellas, and all the rest of the gear. Let's get ready to go. Sheila organizes the schedule. She will meet us at the promenade in 30 minutes. We quickly change into beach attire and then ride bikes to the ocean. The girls recognize the streets. Franklin, Kearney, and Jefferson. Puffy clouds sit motionless in the sky. The tall hardwoods give way to small fir trees and mimosas with fluffy pink flowers. 
The breeze carries a hint of salt air. Kids play tag in a side yard. A baby cries. We meet Sheila at a handicapped parking spot where Stockton Place meets Beach Avenue. The attendant helps her into a wheelchair, and I push her up the ramp to the promenade. She points to a narrow alley between oceanfront shops. Take me over there. We can watch the girls from the deck. Chris and Natalie and April carry towels and an umbrella across the sand. They stop, but instead of setting up camp, they throw their towels down and run into the surf. Even Chris. Chris sure fills that bikini nicely, says Sheila. I'm thinking the same thing. It's the first time I've seen her in a bathing suit. We'll have to go more often. But of course, I don't say anything like that to Sheila. Is she as nice as she is pretty? asks Sheila. Even more so, I say, if that's possible. Do you think you two might marry? Sheila asks straight questions. I guess she figures at her age she has little time to waste. I'd consider myself lucky, I say, but it's too early to know. The girls would certainly welcome it. They love Chris. They love you, says Sheila. She studies me. I get the impression she has watched me while I was watching the girls. A thousand wrinkles cover her face, but her eyes are crystal clear. She says, They love you because you're a wonderful father. Thank you. A shaky hand reaches to grab one of mine. I'm happy for you, she says. I take a step to be by her side. I've been thinking about this moment since I looked at Julie's picture this morning. Not long ago, I moved it from my bedside to the bureau. I have to ask you a question, I say. I'm still standing and she's hunched. You're miles above me, she says. Grab one of those chairs. She points at two plastic chairs positioned against the wall of one of the nearby buildings. Workers might use the chairs for smoke breaks. In a few seconds, my eyes are level with hers. That's better, she says. Let's hear the question. Do you still think of Colin? After all these years, after being married to Jesse and Neil, do you still love him? She leans back and her gaze travels across the sea. As if out there, she can see her past. You'll never forget Julie, she says, and you'll never stop loving her, no matter what you do. She takes a deep breath and appears younger. Her eyes open wide. A trace of red shines in her hair. I think of Colin every day, and I dream about him. I've loved Neil for sixty years, but I never stopped loving Colin. Mischief sparkles in her eyes. And to tell you the truth, I still love Jessie. My head pulls back. Do you really? Did you know that Codger is still alive? She says. No. Yes. He lives in Beverly Hills. He's 101 years old, and he blogs. He what? He's a blogger. Writes about Hollywood and the Golden Age, stuff like that. No kidding. I sent him a friend request on social media. He wants me to come out. Rehash old times, that bastard. I still love him, though. I shake my head. Jesse is a good man. His first novel and some of the films he wrote, they touched people. He wasn't ready to settle when he met me, but he was married to his third wife for over 40 years, and I'm sure he loved her until the day she died. Her eyes turn back to the beach. I can't imagine my life without Neil, my children and grandchildren, or Jesse, but I love Colin as much as ever. He was my first true love, my soulmate. After a quick swim, the girls return and we have lunch at a seafood restaurant on the promenade. Our table is next to a window overlooking the ocean. The sound of surf breaking carries from the shore through the screen to our table. A seagull squawks at sunbathers, begging them for a snack. The owner dotes on Sheila. It turns out he's Tony Santucci's grandson, 
a third-generation year-rounder. Chris asked Sheila for advice on what to order. Try the crab cakes, Sheila says. They're the best you'll find outside of Maryland. It's true, unfortunately. Maryland has the best blue crab, but New Jersey has the best scallops, so it balances out in the end. Natalie and April sit on either side of Sheila. They have grown comfortable and begin to ask her questions about Julie. They want stories. Tell us something about Mommy when she was a kid, says April. A funny story, says Natalie. A funny story, says Sheila. They both nod. I don't know. I'm not too good with funny stories. Sheila nibbles on her lip, blinks rapidly, and rubs her eyes. Julie said something once. Not funny exactly, but memorable. April wiggles in her chair to get closer. Natalie reaches for Sheila's hand. Sheila studies their young faces, moistens her lips with her tongue, and begins. I taught your mother to sail at the age of eight. One day, after a lesson, we tied the sailboat to the dock. Julie sprang to the deck, and I tried to follow. But my foot caught on a board, and I tripped and skinned my knee. Ouch, I say. I was 71 years old, says Sheila, not a dingo pup by a long shot, and I had no business trying that jump. I sat on my butt and stretched my leg to make sure nothing was broken. Julie stared at me with a curious face, as if she were seeing me for the first time. Then she said, Sheila, are you afraid of dying? Oh, my gosh, says Natalie. Did she really say that? How awful. What did you tell her, says April. Sheila laughs and says, You can't worry about dying, dear. If you do, you'll miss out on living. April tilts her head pondering. Natalie nods to acknowledge Sheila's wisdom. But over the years, I've thought a lot about Julie's question, about death. I know more about it now. I lean in, not breathing, my ears straining. I believe in life beyond this life, says Sheila. I don't know how it works, but I've had dreams as real as your ocean swim. I've heard whispers in the wind. I've felt the touch of lovers long since gone. And I believe somewhere out there, I'm 13 years old and learning how to sail. I'm riding a pony in a valley. And I'm on the beach with Colin in Surfer's Paradise. The End Okay, that's the end of the story, Last Beach Day, and it's the end of the series. First, I want to thank all of you for listening to the Sheila stories. I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I did when I first heard them from my second cousin, Thomas Kelly IV. As I mentioned in the very first episode, I heard the early stories from Thomas after having dinner one night at his house in the summer of 2017. We sat on his front porch as the sun set into the hardwoods. I heard the remainder of the stories on a long weekend at his family's beach cottage in Brigantine. The stories impressed me so much that I asked Thomas's permission to publish them in book form. I chose to write them in a way that reconstructed the context in which he told the stories to his daughters, Natalie and April. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. I don't know for sure whether Sheila is a real person or a fictional character created by Thomas. I have never gone to Cape May to try to find Sheila. I have never searched for a bed and breakfast on Franklin Street to see if an old woman is sitting on the porch in a wheelchair watching kids ride by on their bicycles. I do know that Thomas's first wife was named Julie and that she died of cancer when their daughters were very young. And I know that Thomas first met his new wife, Chris, when she rented out the garage apartment at his house. To me, in my heart and soul, Sheila will always be real. 
I hope the Sheila stories will continue to entertain readers of all ages, particularly young girls. Sheila lived a life of adventure and romance that sets a fine example for all of us. Life can be difficult at times, sad, stressful, but we must never give up. We can take one more step. To paraphrase one of Thomas's lines, Sheila would never give up on the future. Well, my friends, as I said in the last episode, we've come a long way in the series, all the way from Queensland in 1935 to the present. I have enjoyed the journey, and I hope you have as well. If so, please share the Sheila stories with your friends and family. If you know a young girl who could use a guiding light, a story with a mix of adventure and romance, buy her a copy of the Sheila stories on Amazon. As for me, I'll go back to writing novels with the goal of entertaining readers. You can always find my work on Amazon. There are several authors by the name of Patrick Kelly, so it's easier to find me by typing the Joe Robbins series into the search bar. That's Robbins with two Bs. To keep in touch, follow me on Facebook at Patrick Kelly Writer or come to my website at PatrickKellyStories.com. I wish for you an adventurous and romantic 2020. As always, on today's episode, we had music by Cinemedia and sound effects by Noise Creations and Zapsplat.com. Thank you, friends. Bye now.